Good afternoon and welcome to the March 2nd, 2021 Lone Tree City Council study session. In support of social distancing requirements and based on the space limitations in our buildings, the city is limiting physical attendance at public meetings to only essential staff, applicants, and elected officials, and will continue to provide access to the public via electronic participation. All attendees are required to wear face coverings when not speaking and maintain a six foot social distance while in the building. The city will also implement symptom monitoring measures for attendees, such as temperature checks and completion of the city's facilities health screening survey before entering the meeting. The City Council does not vote during our study sessions since our presentations are for information and discussion purposes only. Therefore, there is no public comment during our study sessions, but rest assured at our council meeting at seven, there is. So we're gonna start this evening by uh, a presentation from our Youth Commission on an update on what they've been up to. And we've got uh, Sarah Paschke, and uh, Paschke, sorry, Sarah. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Wonderful, welcome. Nice to hear your voice. Hi, it's good to see you. All right, well, hello, Mayor Millay and fellow city council members. Thank you for having me here today to speak to you about the newest updates with the Lone Tree Youth Commission. Since we last spoke to the city council, we have made several significant changes and achievements. I want to begin by discussing our exciting achievement. As you may have known, we applied for the Sodexo Youth Hunger Grant. Um, our Youth Commission Chair, Julia Ragrit, worked really hard to complete the write-up of the grant application, consulting with the rest of the commission frequently. Um, we recently learned that we earned the um, $500 Sodexo grant, which is the highest monetary level that they give out. Um, we were granted the $500 to go directly towards our Youth Hunger Project. This money cannot be used directly on fundraising or meal costs, but can be used for advertising and transportation and any other like accounting tech costs we might have. Um, at our last Youth Commission meeting, we decided to make some changes to our mission statement in our project to combat food insecurity in um, Lone Tree and Douglas County. We initially intended on implementing a meal voucher program at local restaurants, along with launch launching a fundraiser pro project for grocery store gift cards. Um, we were in extensive communication with three selected local restaurants, and we discovered that this meal voucher program really wasn't feasible. Most restaurants have enough on their plates with the current state of the pandemic and are unable to start another new food service program. Um, these communications from restaurants definitely threw us a curveball, but we decided to revise our fundraiser project. Now we are fundraising to purchase gift cards for both grocery stores and local restaurants to distribute to school children and their families who struggle with food insecurity. We have launched a fundraising page through the city of Lone Tree. We have, initial, we have an initial goal of raising $10,000. If we raise more than this target goal, we will likely reach out to schools on the district level to inform them of our project. I am currently gathering information on who would be the best contact at the district level. Um, at this point, not really sure if the school board or if there's more, if there's like secretary level that need to be re reached out to. I would appreciate any input on that if you guys know of anybody who might be the best contact to have. Um, in order to spread the word about this fundraiser, we have used several methods. Us youth commissioners have posted the um, fundraising page on our social media accounts, putting them on our stories, our Instagram bios, and on Twitter, those sorts of things. Um, the city has included information in the HOA newsletter. It was really exciting to see that this week. My dad actually forwarded me the email saying, Sarah, your project is in here. And it was really, really cool to see that that had already been achieved. Um, as well as we have launched some advertising campaigns on different social media websites. Um, this ad is funded by the Sodexo grant. We started off using just a small amount of that money, $125, to launch a Facebook um, ad targeted at uh, middle-aged adults and specifically families. We're hoping to get about 200 clicks and maybe 100 donations from this first ad. Depending on the amount of money and the amount of clicks we get, we might launch another ad in the near future using more of that Sodexo money. If not, we will wait off probably until our meeting in the, um, I think our next meeting will be in three weeks after our meeting tomorrow, and we will discuss that then. Um, so we find a later, of, of, sorry, um, with this change in the program, Julia is going to send um, updates to the Sodexo company. Um, they really want to stay in the loop and know what we're doing and make sure that we're staying on target. Unfortunately, with this change in our uh, mission statement from the voucher program to solely fundraising, 
she feels it's necessary to reach out just so um, they're not surprised if they learn differently of our program. Um, we're really, really excited about this stage of the project. Now is the time that we're actually raising the money and are going to start um, giving out those gift cards to members of our community and pass the brainstorming phase and into the execution. Um, we can't wait until we start purchasing these gift cards and distributing them to the schools. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Are there any questions or comments? Well, one comment, thank you for your passion and your hard work and the whole Youth Commission's hard work on this important issue of food insecurity. I think one of the things we recognized uh, surrounding public health during the COVID pandemic is the very issue of need in Douglas County. So thank you guys for working so hard to address it. And I'm sure our other council members will love to comment and say thanks to you as well. And also congratulations on getting the grant. I think uh, fundraising is the most challenging part of the work of, uh, that any of us do. And the fact that you guys were successful in that grant application speaks really highly of the good work being done. So thanks. I'm going to turn it over to council member Carpenter. Council member. All right. Great job, Sarah. Really, really awesome initiative. And I remember interviewing you and I never mentioned that part of the job description was you being an online uh, marketing executive. So you guys have figured all that all out really well. I think it's a great cause. Um, and I'm certainly will support it as well. And I'll spread the word too, uh, for sure. So, and this is, this is something too. I know, I'm not sure which one of the representatives from the youth commission will be presenting next Monday night at the youth summit, but this would be a great talking point to share with, with the other, the youth in, uh, Douglas County for sure. But great yeah, job. I don't know. I don't know the specifics on that youth summit yet. I know we have a youth commission meeting tomorrow evening. We'll discuss those. I know I'm pretty sure I will, won't be able to attend that summit. So it'll likely be another member, but can definitely update them and let them know that this is what should be talked about at that summit. Sounds good. Great. Thanks for all your hard work. Wonderful. Councilmember uh, Anderson. Thank you, Sarah. What a great initiative and what enthusiasm you have in the uh, Youth Commission for moving this forward. Uh, congratulations on the grant and um, Wish you uh, best of luck, and we will certainly do everything we can to support your fundraising. And Councilmember Shaw. Yes, um, Sarah, thank you. I can't tell you how um, pleased I am to see the Youth Commission unafraid of any goal. <laughs> you guys are um, amazing in the things that you've done, and this $10,000 goal is quite aggressive, uh, but clearly it will be a benefit to the community. So kudos to you all for uh, bringing it forward and for not being afraid. Thank you so much, Sarah. You did a great job tonight, so appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing updates on the fundraising for the food insecurity. Thanks, take good care. Thank you so much. I appreciate your effort to help us spread the word as well. And anything you guys do is, will be super appreciative of. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. So moving on to the good work of another one of the city's uh, boards and commissions. It's our arts commission. And it was wonderful to walk into the Lone Tree Arts Center facility today and actually see the work going up on the walls. It's beautiful. So uh, this evening, we've got a presentation on the commissioner's choice exhibit from uh, the chair of our Lone Tree Arts Commission, uh, introduced first by our important city staff, Paul Ackerman. But we've got Larry Loveless from our our Arts Commission Chair and Colleen Fanning, uh, our Arts Consultant. So first, Paul. Uh, let me introduce our Commission Chair, Larry Loveless, and he will give you a brief background on uh, what led to the Commissioner's Choice. And then uh, Colleen Fanning, our Arts Consultant, will give you an overview of the exhibit. Commissioner. Great to see everyone. <laughs> Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, into the rear view mirror, a look back at 2020. It was not an easy topic to select. And uh, it, it was one of our longer meetings and we went through a lot of potential subjects. And finally, one of the artists, and I'll name her, Joey Freund said, you know, this is so hard. She says, I can't go to my studio. I can't go downtown to sell some of my art. I can't associate with people. I'm at home. So she says, all I'm doing is painting. <laughs> and she says, it's really had an effect on me. And with that, we immediately knew what we had to do. And we selected the topic of into the rear view mirror, a look back at 2020. And if you get a chance to glance at some of the 
submissions because they're just not the typical ones. Yeah. Uh, and once you see the artist statement, you'll see that a great deal of thought and time went into them. So uh, Colleen Fanning is going to take you through some of the uh, highlights of. Uh, Colleen's having some trouble logging on. <laughs> yeah, there okay. goes that virtual business. So yes. We'll, we'll improvise here. As you, I don't know, do you want to go through? Sure. Okay. The um, and, we, and Colleen is so instrumental. I mean, it's one thing to put out a call for entries, but she really knows the people and the artists in the studios, and um, she's just done a tremendous job uh, soliciting some, some pretty great submissions. So um, let me take a look at the first uh, piece that uh, we're going to go through. And this is a, probably the most interesting one. Adrian DeLone did these pandemic self-portraits, and I think we beat her to the subject, to the topic, by about three days because yeah. <laughs> after we had selected it she uh, she went worldwide on instagram it just said wow send me your send me your works and it's got hundreds and hundreds of them and it's so great that when you go out i think this door you'll see some of those works already on display so she was a tremendous addition even though she came in in second place next one and as you look at some of these you you, you you definitely want to read the artist statement, but you can see that he's he's taken a look at this through completely different eyes than what he may have originally. I like this one especially, Francisco Soto. Um, <laughs> he calls it Dispora, Dispora 2. That's usually associated with whole groups of people moving to a different country, or it can be groups moving into very uncomfortable situations. And I guess this case was that they just left their clothes and kept on moving. <laughs> <laughs> ah, this is the radioactive haircut. <laughs> Speaks for itself, yeah. doesn't it? Um, this is good. Oh, this is a toughie. Light and love photography. The young lad that was uh, killed, the violinist. Uh, this is based on that. And there was a number of other pieces that went with it. Um, Solstice Bird, <laughs> it's out on, I'm glad we have it here in person because at first it made me take pause what we were looking at. But uh, this came from our friend Doug Casina down at uh, uh, K Contemporary. And um, it just shows a bird in the dark wondering where he's going to go next. And that's kind of what a lot of people have been confronted with. Uh, Nathan Abel's Tin Shadow, Gray. Um, hey, Larry, you're moving off camera. You got to scoot back so we can see you. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You're no, there you are. Perfect. You know, usually they put a box down. There. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're confining you. I, now that you're giving me a shot. Yeah. <laughs> Nathan uh, spent time in a tent. And he, he photographed some of the shadows that he saw uh, during the night because he didn't want to be at home. Oh, Pamela, these are great. They, uh, if you look at them, they actually float on top of the uh, background. And uh, it's her way of looking at things through new eyes. And I think you'll really love it when you see it up close and personal. Last one, I think we're looking at the invisible girl. A couple more, excuse me. I thought we had five. They, he snuck in two more, seriously. Well, they're beautiful. Um, that one really grabs you when you walk out there. And yet, are we seeing the girl? Maybe not. That's why it's called the invisible girl. It's, you got the dress in the background. And, and until I started reading about the fact that people being picked on these days included other groups, I went, oh, I didn't realize it. So it's very appropriate. These are awesome. No words needed is exactly right. Their sculptures are kind of around the corner. And uh, they really depict how she felt about 2020 and what it was doing to her and, and expressed it beautifully. Poignantly. 
last run. This guy's great. Tom Ward. God bless him. He says, you've got to let me in the show. He says, you've got those beautiful windows there. And he says, you can see them from outside. You can see them from inside because around the back are these panels. This is true collaboration. He and his fellow artists, they didn't know what the hell they were going to, excuse me, what they were going to do. <laughs> it's okay. They didn't. They're scratching their heads. They couldn't drink anymore. They had to keep painting. So they decided, he, did, Tom led them into doing this collaboration from his pals that do a lot of muralists um, are his friends. So they did these works and each one depicted their own studio life and social distance. And uh, <laughs> he's a hoot, he's a great guy. He was here this afternoon finishing up, touching up. And uh, it just shows all the different views of it. So when you take your time looking at it, you'll be amazed. This is the last one. Oh yeah, this is the last one. This is Elijah mm -hmm. McLean. Um, and I'm glad we were able to include this because you can't talk about 2020 without talking about him and how sad it would, was that uh, we lost him. So thank you for your time. Well, I thank you. I mean, I think we are so appreciative of the beautiful space within the Lone Tree Arts Center that we, we can devote to displaying uh, art. And I think you guys have raised the bar with this collection. I think art always makes us think and feel and emote. And I think we all have such a deep reaction to 2020 and this visceral connection to 2020 in different ways. And it, mm -hmm. and so as I briefly walked through, um, I felt myself having a more emotional sure. response to this art than, uh, than I have seen, than I have felt with other so I do really think you guys really hit a nerve with this. So, so yeah. please extend our deep gratitude and thanks to the Arts Commission. I'm sure it was tough looking going through all of this for you as well. So, yeah. And if you see Joey, yes. the, oh, she's having surgery the 18th. I'm going to bring her back in a wheelchair and show her that stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. it was her, her uh, personal thoughts as an artist that drove this. So well, it's great. beautiful. So thank you all. Beautiful. We'd be really proud of the yeah. good work. So thank you very, and yeah. our, our gratitude to the to the whole team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. So moving on from art to uh, capital projects overview, uh, but uh, equally important, and and the uh, I think uh, we're excited about the opportunity to actually get some capital projects done in 2021. So. With that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Jacob James, our city engineer, and he will be presenting virtually. Jacob. Yes, I'm thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mayor and uh, Council. Uh, as you mentioned, we'll give you a brief overview of the projects that the City of Lone Tree Public Works Department is going to be undertaking this year. Um, some very exciting projects and uh, equally exciting uh, studies that we have going on. So we'll go to the next slide. First, I wanted to let Council know that um, Kyoko has done a great job of standing up and externally facing interactive map showing where the uh, capital project locations will be within the city this year. Um, at, as people go to the map, they can click on each individual project to get a little bit of information and then it directs them to another link to give them more detailed information uh, on the city's website uh, related to each project. As we move forward, uh, we will also be populating this map with design studies and um, other projects the city will have going on, as well as um, other projects in the area, potentially led by uh, external entities such as Douglas County or um, other um, utility companies in the area. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll start with the project that Council's well aware of uh, this year, the 2021 Concrete Replacement and Overlay. Um, this project has been in front of council a few times, uh, so we won't uh, belabor it, but uh, this is approximately 12.3 lane miles of asphalt mill and overlay along Lincoln Avenue from I-25 to the western city border. Uh, it's also uh, comes along with uh, replacing damaged sections of concrete and uh, curb and gutter. Next slide on that. 
The uh, concrete and asphalt projects were publicly competitively bid separately. Um, it just turned out that uh, the lowest responsible bidder for both projects is Chavez Construction. The concrete portion of that uh, is $432,109 and the asphalt contract at $1,377,398. Uh, we will slightly have uh, moved the concrete uh, project ahead of the asphalt uh, to get some of the concrete repair or replacement done ahead of the milling project and the repaving project. Uh, Council did approve both these contracts on February 2nd and Chavez has been provided the notice of award and contracts for signature. The notice to proceed is anticipated in March later this, this month or early April for the concrete and May for the overlay. And also, as Council is well aware, uh, this project is um, in partnership this year with uh, several metro districts, uh, the Park Meadows Metro District, the Omni Park, and the Heritage Hills Metro District, uh, all contributing collectively $550,000. Next slide. Our next project uh, that we're going to undertake this year is Crooked Stick Phase 2. Uh, as Council may be aware of, uh, last year uh, the city did um, do Phase 1, which was the signalizing the intersection of Ridgegate Parkway and Crooked Stick. Phase 2 this year, we're going to continue along the south uh, from the intersection along Crooked Stick towards the Bluffs Regional Park, milling and overlaying uh, um, sections of uh, asphalt that uh, have deteriorated over time as well as widening, providing some um, extended parking areas around the Bluffs trailhead. Next slide. The design for this project is complete. Uh, we are planning on advertising this project later this month for a start of a May, uh, May start for construction. Um, and then also uh, along the process, we want to make sure that uh, prior to starting construction and when we have a uh, contractor on board, we're reaching out to local residents and HOAs in the area to coordinate any impacts that could happen during construction. And then we will continue close coordination throughout the project. The budget for this project is $350,000 and we have worked with Douglas County for a $150,000 contribution towards this as well. Next slide. Our next project is another holdover project from last year, but a very important one, the County Line and Yosemite signal improvements. This intersection will be uh, improved uh, from the span wires that you see in the picture here to poles and mast arms. And we'll move to the next slide. The upgrade for the mast arms and the poles um, will bring the intersection to current uh, industry standards um, and uh, add, add the pedestrian heads as well. It'll reduce the long-term maintenance costs associated with span wires and improve the pedestrian leg of uh, south leg of the intersection, which is located in the city of Lone Tree. And the next slide, please. The design on this project is also complete. Uh, we did order the mast arms and poles last week, actually, and that kicked off a 10 week, uh, 10 to 14 week uh, build on those. So um, as we're waiting for the fabrication to be completed, we will advertise the project in spring of this year, uh, plan to start in early summer this year. Um, and then as soon as the contractor is ready to set the poles and mast arms, uh, hopefully they line up with delivery and uh, we can get those in place uh, in early, early fall this year. The project budget is $600,000, including the, the mast arm and pole order. Um, and with this project, we do have the Douglas County uh, contribution, 50% uh, of this project. And currently with the budget, um, that equates to $300,000. And next slide. We have one partnering project this year that's under construction, and that's with the Mile High Flood District. We've driven Park Meadows Drive uh, over by Willow Creek. You've noticed some construction activity going on in that area. Um, the city contacted Mile High Flood District early last year and requested a sediment removal um, at this location. And also um, there was a concern that was noted, uh, you can see in the picture, uh, staff did identify a, a bank sloughing uh, concern right off of the road and we wanted to get that investigated a little bit more to make sure that there wasn't something bigger going on with the with the culvert crossings. As we're going through the project, um, it's looking to be more and more like a surface issue and not an underlying issue, which is uh, which is a, a good thing for sure. Um, but with this project, the city does have a budget of $75,000 to address any needs that uh, need to occur to protect the road surface um, 
uh, from a maintenance standpoint. Uh, to date, the Mile High Flood District has uh, put $420,000 uh, worth of construction and sediment removal effort into this project. So uh, very good partnership with them uh, indeed. And we'll move to the next slide. So that's the construction projects that uh, the Public Works Department will, will be undertaking this year. Now we're going to um, show you a few of the design efforts and studies that uh, the department will also be working on. We'll start with some Dr. Cog funded projects. The first and, and biggest one is the Lincoln and I-25 interchange uh, study. We are actually reviewing RFPs from consultants uh, currently, um, so we are definitely in the process of getting that intersection looked at, uh, especially from an alternative standpoint and a pedestrian and vehicle mobility improvement standpoint. The second one is the Acres Green C470 pedestrian bridge. We are actually out for RFP for design services on this project as well in partnership with Douglas County, and we expect to have that design ongoing throughout the rest of the year with construction starting next year. The third that we have on the list here is the C470 trail spur at Park Meadows, and this is a safer Main Streets grant the city was awarded earlier this year, and we'll be looking at embarking on design uh, later this year for that project as well. Some other projects that are more uh, spread across the city um, include the pedestrian improvement projects or the rapid re rectangular flashing beacons uh, at various locations. This is also a Dr. Cog uh, Safer Main Streets funded project, so we're excited about continuing the design on that and moving that into construction next year as well. Uh, the city will also be working with uh, Molar Engineering on a stormwater infrastructure study which really takes a look at all of the stormwater assets within the city um, and forecasts the projected growth of the stormwater assets on the east side and really puts a plan together to look at how do we uh, plan for repair, maintenance, and ultimate rehabilitation or replacement of all of the assets so that it help, helps inform um, what the city needs to plan for in the future rather than reacting if, um, you know, we see an unfortunate incident like the county line road sinkhole again. Um, hopefully, you know, this study helps us um, anticipate those and, um, prepare for them and be more uh, proactive rather than reactive. Uh, the uh, 2022 concrete replacement and overlay uh, project, we will start looking at this fall as well, putting together our next package. I think that we've found that putting the um, the next year's package together early and bidding it early has um, bared some, some very good bid results. So that's a model we're going to continue to work on. So we will start looking at uh, next year's locations uh, this fall. And then also partnering with the Park Meadows Metro District on the brick fence assessment throughout the city. And next slide, please. There are also a few projects uh, that are going to be happening within or around the city of Lone Tree that the city doesn't have a uh, funding interest in, um, but these are projects that um, are going to affect you know, the, the people in and around the city in one, one way or another. The first is the C-470 pedestrian bridge at Yosemite. Uh, this is a Douglas County led project and the uh, council's been briefed on this before, but this project is set to go to construction later this year. So that is one location to um, keep an eye on. Um, we, there will be some activity uh, there, uh, probably in the summer time frame. The Havana Street improvements at Meridian is also a Douglas County led project that's been in the works for a few years now. And, we do expect that to go to construction this year. Uh, moving to our um, development partner um, projects, uh, Rampart Range Metro District. If you've been down uh, by Ridgegate and Havana lately, um, you've probably noticed some construction equipment in that vicinity. Uh, they've already started a detention pond relocation project, which is really a project to move a detention pond near the light rail station at the end of line station to pave the way for the COBOL affordable housing project the council just heard. Uh, so that project is actually under construction right now and they are they are well underway and uh, from what we hear, hoping to be wrapped up with that by April. And along with that, uh, and spurring more development uh, in the TOD area, the Rampart Range Metro District does have plans for widening Havana south of Ridgegate Parkway, which will start with the first phase of widening um, down to our future High Note Avenue right of way. 
um, then that will also be in concert with the development of the uh, affordable housing and the apartment complexes down there. Another project uh, we wanted to bring to Council's attention that we are tracking closely with the Southgate Water and Sanitation District is a water line replacement that they are designing currently. Um, the water line that they are currently designing to replace is underneath Yosemite Street, uh, starting at Heritage Hills and extending north to C470. So a pretty sizable project uh, that they are going to be embarking on design and finishing design in 2021 with the expectation of going to construction in 2022. So we're going to continue to work closely with Southgate um, as they prepare their designs and, and make sure that uh, the city is in a good position to work with them as they need to replace the aging infrastructure underneath our city streets. <coughs> and next slide, please. Wait, Jacob, can I stop you there on that one? Sure. Uh, yep. So that's going to involve tearing up Yosemite, I assume, if we're replacing the water line. Their water so, line is in Yosemite in, in several right. locations, yes. Yeah. So have are we coordinating that with the street, any concrete overlay work that we're going to be doing? Or are you guys factoring that in um, as we get the schedule for that project? I mean, that's a pretty big, significant we're going to be tearing up Lincoln in 2021, and then this is, is this a 2022 project we're thinking? Yes. Yeah, that's kind of messy. So uh, I, I know you guys are going to do a great job coordinating, but I think council's going to, going to want to be kept up to speed on how that may impact our work uh, and also how it will impact our residents and uh, businesses. So Yes, absolutely. Little yeah. asterisk next to that one. Thanks. Sure. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, we we've already had uh, initial conversations with them as uh, we do want to see the impacts of of what they're proposing. And uh, to your point, we do want to make sure that if there's anything else that needs to happen in the area, um, you know, this is a good time to coordinate all that effort, uh, at, you know, and, and minimize the disturbance uh, to the public for sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah. Next slide. Okay, so um, those are all the construction projects and all the design projects and other external projects um, that uh, the staff is aware of as of now. So moving forward, we do want to also talk to Council about um, IGAs um, that are associated with all these projects. Uh, Council's already seen the IGAs with the Lincoln Overlay project. Um, all of these other projects, however, will have federal funds or Douglas County funds associated with them. So we do want to uh, let council know that uh, we will be coming soon um, with some of these projects uh, for council consideration with IGAs. Uh, the first one is Lincoln and I-25, the traffic and mobility improvements project that we mentioned. This was part of the 2021 to 2023 Dr. Cog tip cycle. Uh, the CDOT IGA that we are working on is um, a contribution from uh, CDOT for 1.25 million and then Douglas County also has a $350,000 contribution towards uh, this project as well. We're hoping to have both of those IGAs ready for council consideration at the April 6th meeting and then as we move forward with this project there will be future contributions by Douglas County and the City of Lone Tree uh, moving forward um, as we go through this process. Uh, it's a multi-year project so in 2022 and 2023 there will be additional amendments um, to this IGA as well. The Acres Green pedestrian bridge that I mentioned, this is a design um, only IGA at the moment. So uh, Douglas County and the city will be contributing to the design of this project with Douglas County's contribution being 200,000 and the city's contribution being 150,000. Again, we're, we're tracking this IGA to also hit the April 6th council meeting for council um, consideration. And uh, the construction portion of this um, as we move into that phase will occur in 2022. And next slide, please. Now, uh, there are also some projects that we're working with that I mentioned that are just between Douglas County and the city of Lone Tree. So these are uh, the county line and Yosemite traffic signal reconstruction project. Uh, the, that's a 50-50 split between the two agencies and with the current budget, um, that split is $300,000 each. This IGA is also on track for uh, April 6th consideration by council. And the Crooked Stick Phase 2 project, which I mentioned uh, a Douglas County contribution of $150,000 and the city's contribution of $200,000 also tracking towards April 6th. And next slide. 
so those are the IGAs. There are several other IGAs that we're tracking. Um, however, we do uh, uh, the, we need a little bit more time to get those gathered um, with the other um, CDOT or Dr. Cog projects that we have. So we do expect to come to council later this year with those projects. This is my last slide. Um, uh, unfortunate, but we do want to bring um, uh, a high level um, um, understanding to council of an uh, occurrence that happened uh, a few weeks ago now on April or on uh, February 18th. Uh, the Public Works Department was informed on February 18th of an incident of a bridge strike on Sky Ridge Bridge on I-25. This is the northbound lanes of I-25 and it's the, the easternmost northbound lane. Uh, the, the city and CDOT responded to um, an accident that occurred with a contractor uh, carrying an excavator on a flatbed trailer and the excavator arm uh, struck the girder of the Sky Ridge Bridge. Uh, upon uh, immediate inspection um, and response, uh, the city and mostly CDOT and Federal Highways um, did did require a five hour closure of northbound I-25 to ensure that uh, an adequate assessment could be made of the girder and the damage um, without live traffic under it. So that did occur. Um, CDOT did um, do the immediate cleanup and the immediate inspection, uh, determined that the the lanes were safe to open with the one exception of the lane directly under the strike um, just due to concerns of potential um, concrete fall um, um, that that could occur overnight. Um, the next day um, city staff was able to uh, get our on call uh, inspection consultant uh, Alfred Banesh and company. Um, they are actually coincidentally um, a one of the CDOT uh, bridge inspection companies as well. So we're able to mobilize them quickly um, through our on-call agreement with them to come do an emergency bridge inspection for the city as well. Um, so they did that uh, on Friday, February 19th. Um, and we've been working ever since with CDOT and our, um, our consultants to put a plan together to address this damage. Uh, CDOT has given the city 30 days from February 18th to come up with a plan to address uh, the damage and, and a plan moving forward to uh, either repair or replace the skirter. The city has uh, contracted or is in the process of contracting on an emergency basis with the, uh, the engineering company of record for this bridge, which is WSP. So we've got the, the professional engineer that designed this bridge along with uh, WSP, the company, uh, to look at this uh, damage and uh, give the city a recommendation on how to address this in short order. The city is working with the Rampart Range Metro D District who built this bridge um, and CDOT and Federal Highways and all of our consultants to expeditiously, expeditiously get a, a resolution and a plan forward um, to, to uh, addressing this unfortunate issue. We, we are hoping to come back to council very soon, um, it, potentially as soon as the next council meeting, um, if the council desires, for uh, another update. Um, the, the process moving forward um, does need to be quick um, just because this is over a, a, an inter interstate highway um, and we want to make sure that uh, anything that uh, needs to be addressed immediately is. So um, just wanted to give council a brief overview of that. Um, we are working on it. We're working with all of our partners on it. Um, CDOT and Federal Highways have, have been great partners on this. Actually, so they, they've lended a lot of uh, a lot of help, which has been really great. And then um, our consultants have also been very good at uh, jumping on this and making this a very high priority for them as well. So, with that, that is my last slide. So I'm happy to answer any questions on any part of this presentation. Jacob, thanks so much. And I think council absolutely wants to see uh, hear an update on that one, particularly since you have 30 days to respond to CDOT. So our council meeting will fall just right before that. So uh, it, it is a high profile project <laughs> in the city. I'm sure council received a lot of phone calls about what was happening on that freeway. And uh, kudos to our police department for their uh, role in the response as well. 
Um, so you mentioned a lot of partners, Jacob. So in addition to an outstanding public work staff, we've got some thank you notes to write to Douglas County, to our metro districts, to, Her uh, to uh, Mile High Flood District, to Dr. Cog and CDOT. And I think it speaks to the great relationships that council has with those entities, but also our staff who works closely with them to get things done. So uh, I, I think um, we are doing more with less in 2021 because we're leveraging those partnerships. So huge thanks to all of the individuals responsible for that. So those are my comments. I want to turn it over. Wynn. So yes, I echo uh, everything that the mayor has said about our partnerships. It's been, you know, kind of a lifeline. And um, I was wondering if you perhaps had an update for us on um, whether or not there might be some damages recoverable from the trucking company or uh, any of those things. So our legal legal department probably has, and, and it's in the process of okay. being negotiated. We'll get, okay. we'll hear so more on that. Yeah. Here, yes. But thank you for yeah. pursuing all angles. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Jake, Councilman Carpenter. Great. So thanks, Jacob. It's really refreshing to have this pipeline of projects again. It uh, truly is. I had a question for you, though, regarding the span wires on county line. Is I know we've been knocking off the, the list over the years. How, do we have any more span wires, or is this the last one that will be masted? There are additional span wires. So we, we do have a county line at Willow. Um, we have county line at Acres Green. Um, and I believe I'm missing another one. Um, but we are we are knocking them off. Um, County line at Acres Green actually is a um, HSIP project that the city awarded was awarded funding for as well. So we'll be partnering with uh, Dr. Cog on on that project as well. Um, that project is trending towards 2023 at this at this point. OK, thanks. Over time, we'll get there. Yeah. That's it for me. At Mike. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for that update. Um, COVID may have had its impact on things, but it certainly sounds like we've had our hands full in the planning phase, working with partners, trying to keep uh, infrastructure updated and moving forward on some capital opportunities. Um, I would appreciate, as Jackie mentioned, the mayor mentioned earlier, uh, updates on the Yosemite and the stormwater piping. Uh, I know that is going to solicit some response from our community in terms of what are we doing, why are we doing it, making sure we're doing it with minimum impacts to the community. Sure, absolutely. Jacob, thank you. Great job and appreciate the great work that uh, you are championing for the city. So thanks. Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is uh, our police department update. Chief Wilson is here presenting in person. Uh, you guys have certainly had a busy uh, few. When are you not busy, though? <laughs> it has been busy. Yeah. Um, I tried to make a little bit more colorful presentation this time. So there you go. Anyway, yeah. thanks for having me, Mayor and, and City Council. Um, so I just want to, I've been here a couple times giving you some updates on some other things, but um, <clears throat> we will. Uh, I'm going to introduce quite a few people you've never seen before, uh, or because we've hired a few people and people have been promoted. So uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So these are pictures that. Um, Denise assisted with us getting some photographs of the department um, so that we could utilize these when we're trying to recruit and, and get those on our website. And so one picture was a little more serious than the other, uh, but everybody had a good time uh, taking the pictures. This is probably sometime in May. We were well well into COVID and a number of other things going on. So I just want to talk about morale and retention. So I think we've done pretty well. Uh, it certainly was a rough year. Um, you know, COVID was one thing, but uh, when uh, the Senate bill and when the protest began, it was definitely uh, weighing heavy on our officers. But I think we were pretty proactive in trying to address that, try to do some fun things. And you're going to see quite a few, I think, really cool things that we did throughout throughout the year um, and really try to get ahead of uh, that Senate bill uh, with Linda's help and her team and and collaborating with our regional partners um, and really just trying to, um, you know, do the best we could with what it was and, and, and really not allow um, folks to read more into it than it really that was really there, even though there has been some impact and there will continue to be as as things from that bill um, come into their time frame when they're when we have to do them and there's more bills on the horizon. So 
but I think for the most part, I feel pretty good where we're at as a, as a department. Um, Seth set through a supervisor meeting we had just a month ago, and I mean, it was pretty upbeat. And I think uh, in general, everybody felt pretty good where, where the department was. Go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. So I want to say thanks to uh, the, the community and um, and to the, the we're going the wrong direction, but uh, <laughs> and to the members of the city uh, who I think have been really supportive of the police department. And um, you know whether it was the the loan for each um, program, uh, those candy bars I think were great. They were very timely. Um, there's a number of people on the list on that slide that I want to specifically mention, which is Justin Russell and uh, all the great work he's done. I mean, it was literally, I mean, I, there was not a day that goes by that he wasn't in there making sure that things were sanitized, that we had all our equipment. Uh, and he's just been, I think, just done a fantastic job. Tyler uh, and his team were, you know, we, we did have some people end up working from home, like our records folks and some of our detectives, and they had to be pretty nimble to get those folks set up and, and really were very responsive trying to, for the first, I mean, I never would have thought we would ever do records from anybody's house. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, it, it was, and, and certainly I didn't think we were gonna be very effective having detectives at home. But in reality, we, we were pretty effective with that. And, and we, not that they weren't rotating in like uh, once a week or and taking their turn, but we actually were pr very productive. We leveraged teams the whole time daily meetings between the commander and the sergeants and the detectives and so some things that i would have you to ask me like could this work i've been like absolutely not but we had to make it work and, and tyler was a big part of that uh bill and his support um you know through the keeping us updated on everything helping us develop some internal policies for our officers and some internal procedures uh helping coordinate the vaccine um uli what what do i what do I got to say about Uli? She's I mean, got the money. She's got yeah. the money, but she's been really helpful when we when we were trying to, you know, do the tasers and do some things that we really needed to upgrade um, and, and figuring out where we could say we had money saved in our budget already to, to pay for those things. So, um, you know, and then Cami, it, there's a picture of her right there, diligently at work. This is in the first few weeks of COVID before really anybody was really wearing a lot of masks and she started making masks and, and delivered um, those masks to everybody on the department. So uh, very nice of her to do that. And then you guys have been fantastic in your support and I, and I appreciate it. And, and, um, and as well as the YES committee, uh, who's done some, a lot of really great things for the entire city, but certainly for uh, low trade. And I'm sure I'm missing people like Seth and Kristen and a number of other folks, but I just wanted to take the time to say thank you. So. Uh, next one, one slide. <laughs> um, so again, morale and retention. We had we had Lone Tree resident support uh, really early on, uh, particularly when the um, the protest began. Um, we, you know, the cold support was meaningful. The left we leveraged teams. Uh, we really tried to focus on community policing, especially when a lot of the businesses were shut down. We tried to get into the communities and just make outreaches there and. We had, I don't remember whose kids came over and did that, but anyway, they came over and decorated the sidewalks for the officers. And um, and then that's a thing that we did with in May with the fire department and other local agencies to just kind of support Sky Ridge. Um, and then again, just really try to be proactive with dealing with COVID and, and, and the Senate bill. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, so here's how I just want to talk about some new employees we have. So the victim advocate that we got uh, funded through that grant, through the uh, Volker grant, uh, we hired her. That's Connie Stauffer. Uh, so she started on January 25th, and she's coming from El Paso County. Her family's moving up here. Uh, she has three years, a lot of experience, but three years as a victim advocate. And then we hired Lucero Cuevas, and she was a volunteer, and she was actually in our VIP learning how to do patrol. And uh, we had an opening uh, to replace a community safety officer who left. So she's doing a fantastic job and she wants to be a police officer and she's going to school uh, to do that. And so this is a really good first step for her to um, and um, to get some training and, and hopefully, you know, reach that dream that she wants to reach. So next slide. Um, we've hired Brian Taylor. Uh, he had two years out of Gillette uh, Police Department. Uh, so he started on February 24th. Perfect timing. Um, he was our first 
COVID victim for the, for the department. I mean, he's great, great first month for him uh, coming on the department. And, uh, but he, he's really a very good officer, a very calm, um, a mature, had a kind of a career before all this and then decided he wanted to be a police officer. And he is from Colorado as well as his wife, and they just wanted to get back here. And then Jacob Tarr, uh, his dad used to work for Parker, and uh, we hired him. He went through the police academy. And so he came out of the academy. Oh, he went through the academy with COVID, uh, all sorts of adjustments trying to get him through the academy. Uh, you know, they ended up doing some of the things virtually from home, and it was really difficult, I think, academy experience for him. Yeah. Um, graduated academy in June, right in the middle of the height of everything, uh, to hit the street. And so, uh, but he's done an excellent job. He's out on his own now. And then he, like I said, he was born and raised in, in Parker. Go ahead, next slide. So Chief, we actually did get to meet them because they have, they, we I couldn't we, remember. We met okay. them Boy. right, that, I was like, wait a minute, right before everything, right the world shut you, down. Well, that's uh, good. I'm glad so we glad blame them you. for it. <laughs> <Okay>. Right. <laughs> Yeah, they're the catalyst. Yeah, I'm sure that direct line. So we've hired these two officers uh, just recently, uh, January 25th, uh, 2021. So it's Michael Travis, and he goes by Mo, but it's Anselmo Cusada, and um, which I think I, I massacred, or massacred that the first time. But anyway, uh, Michael is a nine-year veteran out of, out of Salida, and they wanted to move here to the Front Range. Um, and so he... Oddly enough, they're both from Grand Junction, but um, uh, Mo just graduated a, a police academy and a community college, and um, uh, he's going to be a great addition. He's really actually been involved in three significant calls so far, and oddly enough, he speaks fluent Spanish, and they both needed a Spanish officer to assist, oh. so he's gotten some really good experience. Oh, great. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and then we've had promotions as a result of creating those, those uh, lieutenant positions. And of course, with um, Sergeant Mike Diamond leaving uh, just recently. So Steve Garcia um, was the first one and then Mark Payne and then James Nunn was just promoted on January 31st. So they've taken their new positions um, and you've, you're familiar with them. And next slide. And then we have three new sergeants. So Kyle Maddox, uh, which I know you're familiar with him. He's a he's a favorite, I think, is what I've been told. No, he he's on his way out. There's a new guy. <laughs> There's a new one now. Yeah. There's a new favorite. And so Travis, and he's Travis is actually out at the out at the mall for his first assignment. And Kenny Medina, um, yep. Kenny Medina, I've I've sworn him in every year he's been here. I've, I've sworn him in, you know, when he came and promoted a corporal, and then within a year he was just promoted a corporal back in February. That's because he's a Regis guy. That must be it. his roots at Regis <laughs> Jesuit. He has a lot of a lot of experience, and he's he's got a lot of um, leadership ability. And he's he's going to do a fantastic job for us. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. And then, of course, you uh, know uh, we promoted uh, Joseph and, and Brett um, December sixth. Um, we gave them about a month so they could get some training and get get prepared uh, to hit the ground uh, and actually help us as we train the other officers because one of the, the other supervisors because. We tried to vamp up our, or build up our FTO program for sergeants a little bit better than we have in the past to make sure that they're prepared when they get to their uh, shifts. Um, and so they've been working on that and, and continuing to develop a, a good training program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that implementation here in a minute. I want to know how you made him look so scary. I've never seen Joe. Joe Dillon looked so I, scary. Yeah, he, I was like, yeah. if he was half that serious, there. we'd have something. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> go ahead, go to the next slide. Um, so we, I did swear them in in a little thing in the Juniper room. Um, I thought I'd just show you a quick picture of that. But the implementation has been really good. Um, I've met with um, officers and the advisory committee and met with all the sergeants and really just tried to you know stay on top of that and make sure it's going well. And it's all been very, very positive from the officers. I, they, they don't work the same shift, so they're doing a common Friday because I wanted to break up that A side, B side a little bit and just let's, let's, we're one big team and I've been wanting to make sure we just continue to hammer that home. So I think they were a little reluctant to do that, but now they see, I think they see the value of them now touching and, and working with people from both sides of the week on a regular basis. And that's, so that's been a real positive. Uh, so they work a common Friday. And then, you know, again, they're improving the FTO program. I think it's improved some cohesion. Uh, it's not, it certainly improved some oversight um, and the sergeants, uh, especially some of the newer ones, have been very grateful to have an additional resource out there that they can immediately reach out to or have someone that can respond to, 
some of these more difficult things that go on uh, and help support them. And they've actually been instrumental in helping support the In-N-Out Burger, actually, uh, because they've taken over supervision of that whole thing during the evening. Um, so, um, and then again, I think it, one of the things it did that was positive for the department, it provided some mobility and provided some opportunities to folks that may otherwise have not had that. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And then I just want to talk a little bit about COVID. So the challenges, you know, have been uh, training. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we did about them. So like police one, we started using a common Wednesday to push out hours and hours and I actually did all the training myself as well. Hours of training on police one to cover all of our uh, post uh, requirements and a number of other uh, specific things that we wanted to focus on this year. We're still going to do some some in person in service that's going to allow us to, to focus on some other things instead of, you know, doing some what I would say are a little bit more boring um, things that sometimes we have to present on and police one has been a great resource for that. Um, and then we've we've really leveraged teams and smart force to stay connected. There's been months where we're not having briefings at all. And so our sergeants got adept at running briefings on a team. So the, on the phone. Um, and then it's uh, we, it's allowed us to really, I think, actually stay pretty connected to our entire department, despite the fact that we can't get very often inside of a inside of a room. And then, you know, it, it was a challenge early on with the enforcement of the health department. Some of the rules that kept coming out and they were changing weekly. Again, you know, shout out to Bill for keeping us informed and trying to make some sense of it for us. But our CPU team, they did a phenomenal job, sometimes going business to business to business. Yep to have discussions with the early on with the with the um, business owners who, who were confused about what they needed to do uh, and encouraging them, quite frankly, to do some recommended practices before those practices even became mandatory and asking them to start taking the uh, steps. So they did a great job doing that. I don't think we've written a single mask ticket. We certainly have a few confrontations and people that have been asked to leave by store owners and then, and we've had to respond to those. but. Really, it's just been education and, and trying to work with people. And um, again, we remote worked, uh, did a lot of collaboration and a lot of different ways that I didn't anticipate we would do. And we'll continue, I think, to leverage those things when we ever can stop wearing masks. We'll continue to, to use it. Uh, and then again, we took this opportunity when we slowed down with calls for service to really try to get out in our neighborhoods and go contact people and engage with the community and, and businesses. And then you know, we've utilized the VIPs as best we can, and they all came back, by the way, um, yeah. March 1st. So we're happy to have them back. And I think they're pretty excited about being back. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And then the Senate bill, uh, you know, that was uh, through another little wrench into our, our year. Um, but boy, I tell you, right away, we had people coming in uh, to encourage us. And um, this group is a preschooler. I'm back. I'm in this picture somewhere. I'm back in the back. But um, yeah, it was a really cool event. They came here and had all these signs made up, so we, we took some pictures with them. Um, we have, we really jumped all over getting our policies updated. Uh, again, Linda's team helped us make sure we did that right. And then we had our training done really early on. I think by August we were doing our training that was uh, due uh, sometime in September. Um, and then um, again, I thank you very much for the tasers. I think people are, are a lot more confident with those. The added features that it activates on its own and. Well, that has been actually a little bit of a challenge because they're not used to that, <laughs> but they are finally getting used to it. I think they appreciate the fact that it activates. Um, and uh, and again, there's been a lot of morale change or challenges, but I think us focusing on the community and then the community really reciprocating that has really helped. And then we've it actually has really improved our regional collaboration. So we've, you know, I have I was having weekly meetings. I'm now having biweekly meetings or twice a month meetings with the chiefs and the and the sheriff. That has continued throughout this entire pandemic and throughout all these changes, and that's really helped all of us develop policies and, and move forward with some certain steps. And we, we got some other things we're going to continue to try to bring to the region. So uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of those things is training, um, and I'll explain that little uh, that graph there on the right. But Sergeant Kavina is assigned to coordinate training for the department. Uh, he's and he really he's the right guy for the job. I've been very, very impressed with his organization and his ability to use um, the technology that was available to him. So he designs courses himself on police one and then can push it out. Uh, wow. He's connected it to our policies the way we haven't really done before uh, and, and a lot of accountability with that system. 
Um, but here's some of the things we're going to focus on. That's one's decision making. That's what that model's about. We're I'm trying to collaborate with the sheriff and the two chiefs to tr bring ICAT training here. It's a it's a it's a perf, um, which is a police the police research forum. Um, it's their training that they've developed, and it's specifically about making about developing good decision making practices. And it it's and it has to do with when it's when you're having a critical issue. So. You, you couple these two things together. We already do CIT training. So this is like a more advanced CIT training. Um, and so we're working towards trying to bring this. It's very difficult with COVID because these, these require role players and mm. a number of other logistic issues. Um, but um, that's one of the things we're, we're trying to bring here. Either way, we've been doing more decision-making training with the resources we have available. And again, we're gonna focus, uh, still focus on officer safety. Uh, one of the things that ICAT talks about and some other things that we're looking at is doing things about legitimacy and, and procedural justice when it comes to policing. And legitimacy, and I don't know if I've really talked about that with you guys before, but what that really means is, can I do it, but should I do it? You know, can I take this action? Should I take the action? You know, and just being thoughtful about um, who we stop, how we stop, and why we stop them. And then procedural justice is how you interact with them and making sure that you're professional and um and um and give them a voice and allow them to speak and allow them to say their side of the story regardless of the situation so those are things i think we do well however um i think we can do better and i think it's uh, we i'm still we still want to slow down more and make really good decisions as we're, as we're going on scene and not um and, and understand the situation sometimes you know it's like a dog chasing a squirrel it ran so now the dog's after it we need to stop, think about what we're doing, use our radios, make sure we have the right number of people there. And that's what ICAT's for. It's to get people to slow down, think about what the real situation is, and then come up with a plan to move forward. So um, so that, it's an ongoing process, and it's one I think it's worth doing. So, and, and ICAT stands for Integrating Communications Assessment and Tactics. So it's a whole thing, 40 hours of training, um, but Hopefully we can get it here and, and uh, maybe even find some grant funding out there to help help pay for that. Uh, next slide. Chief, how much does it cost? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it may be we can collaborate with them and, and have it free. I don't know yet. I like it's free. It, I do too. <laughs> I think it's going to cost some money, but I think if we can get it done in a regional way, mm -hmm. we can reduce the cost, spread out the money, get a lot of people into those classes at one time. Because it, it's a pretty big operation if you're starting to bring role players in and 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 we want to try to get our own instructors train the trainer type folks so yeah. it's going to take a while to, yeah. to get it off the ground i just want to talk about community policing this is a really great photo this um is um laura's donuts tribute that happened on october 3rd my house yeah that's right. that's, <laughs> is that really I remember that yeah in our I am do you know right that you know her street. oh yeah yeah so she's um has cancer and, and, and the officers and the, and the fire department wanted to go over and give her a tribute. And they made that sign and, and we all signed it. And and so you can see our folks there, some VIPs and, and South Metro. I just, I thought it was a really cool picture. So I just wanted to share yeah. it with you. Um, and so anyway, uh, we have our high priority and focus <coughs> in 2021 is, is and I, this is gonna be a redundant slide. I didn't realize I had done this. You know that new slide I gave you? This is gonna say the same thing. <laughs> So our, our focus is crime-free housing, community uh, police citizen advisory uh, committee. We're going to continue to focus on that, coordinating special events and just making sure we're doing that in the safest way possible. Um, and then we're going to really focus on our connection with the school um, and, and trying to work with them. And then, and then again, we're going to really focus on more so than we probably have in the past on community presence and being in the in the having good balance, but being in those neighborhoods and making sure we're waving to people and talking to people and just and just having a, a really good connection in our neighborhoods. Go ahead and go to the next slide. It's gonna be a little redundant. But I wanted the picture here. So I wanted to tell you, we got two, the whole CPU units changed out. So that's uh, Officer Ricky Stegmeyer, Officer Kelly Krasekwit and Sergeant Scott Kavina. And yes, Kelly is old enough to be a police officer. <laughs> um, she, um, um, She's do, they're both doing a great job, but there's a little bit of a learning curve because we switched out. We ended up switching out both officers at the same time. Um, and again, I'm just repeating what I just said, so we're yep. going to skip over the priorities. Um, and then I just want to talk a little bit about our regional collaboration. So the, here's some pictures from the In-N-Out Burger. Um, you know, the sheriff 
brought out the big brand new shiny uh, command post, which has a ton of cool things that it can do. They wanted an opportunity to be able to, because that's the first time they've ever deployed it was here. So they want an opportunity to do that. <laughs> but I, but I can tell you that, hard. you know, our relationship with the Sheriff's Department and the other agencies probably has never been better than it, than it has been right now. I really feel like we came together. Not that it wasn't good before, but through all the events of this year, uh, having to collaborate with um, putting those teams together, you know, anticipating possible protests. And, uh, you know, it, it really did make us have to communicate even more so than we already did. Um, and we continue with FIRST and, and the impact team uh, and the regional SWAT teams. And then um, we've really, I think, worked on it. We improved our IGA with Parker, but we, we improved our monthly collaboration with them. So we're doing a much better job of actually doing a, a meeting that involves, uh, you know, officers and sergeants and the commander to talk about what issues there may or may not be when it comes to the communications and, and or the evidence um, part. And then uh, again, with South Metro and, and uh, Fire Department, our relationship has been very good. We've collaborated on a, a number of things this year, more community-based probably than anything else. Um, and then the ERPO, we've had to collaborate through those, and, and you guys know we've had to you know, do a couple of those already. Uh, and then we've also collaborated with the Sheriff's Department on, on our mental health initiative for the officers, and as well as the mental health, op, mental health uh, for um, the region when it comes to response. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So I just want to talk about some mental health challenges that we've we've been facing. We don't have very good data on this, so we're working on a way to try to track calls that are related to that have a mental health component. Um, the only numbers that I really have are, are hard numbers if it just got labeled a mental health call. So we went from oh. about um, about I think it was 16 or so in one year where there was just a mental health call to I think 30 or to 40 this year. But we just not we aren't tracking right because what's what's happening is is that it gets called in as a trespassing or it gets called in as a shoplifter or it gets called in, you know, as an intoxicated person. And so it's labeled that way. And then we don't really see that it's a it's hard to pull that data out. But I can almost tell you probably a day doesn't go by that we don't respond to some call involving someone with a mental health issue. In fact, I sent Seth a email last week on a very uh, strange person we ended up contacting, CDOT, who was threatening the officers and just really acting out of control. And luckily, the CRT team came over and helped with that call, and we got him to calm down and finally got him over to the hospital where he was committed, you know, got an M1 hold placed on him. Um, we did an average of about 60 CIT referrals, and all that is that the officer fills out a CIT referral, and then we refer it to um, a clinician who will then try to follow up with that person. There's some challenges to that as well because a lot of the people referring might be transient, don't have a permanent address, so they're difficult to follow up with. I did find out that those referrals, when we do send them over, because now they go to the CRT team locally, that they do send them to the where the person may live. Like if, if we think they're going to Denver, then we'll send it to the Denver Star team. They have a, they have a new team there. So we're trying to collaborate regionally, but it, it's, a, it's a moving target. If they're a resident here, it's easier. But a lot of the folks we contact are, are not residents that, that may have a mental health issue or a substance abuse problem. Mm -hmm. So we're at about 40 to 50 officers that have CIT training. We're getting ready to send about three or four more, which is a pretty good number to have that many people that have the critical incident response um, training. And um, so let me just talk about the CRT team that we utilize. Um, so there's four countywide teams uh, that, that are made up of One's in Parker with a Parker officer and a clinician, two county. Uh, one of those is for the schools. One of those is for uh, um, adults, I guess, if you want to call it that. And then and then there's another team that, that Castle Rock has to put an officer with and a clinician. Um, there's This is what they've had. They've had about 840 referrals. We account for about 6% of those as a, as a city. And then they've had 655 call outs, which we also account for about 6% of their call outs. Um, and the county is looking to try to expand those over the next year or two. Um, so they actually want to double it to about eight teams um, because they're, they're basically they're only covering about 10 hours a day and these calls are coming in at all, all times of the night and, and, and early in the morning. So, and then I pulled some information out of National Alliance on Mental Illness and I got, I got to tell you, it was a really scary, um, um, <laughs> these are some weird, crazy numbers. I mean, 832,000 adults in Colorado they estimate have some type of mental illness. 50% uh, of them begin by age 14, 
Um, and then one of eight emergency departments, one out of every eight emergency department visit is a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. um, and four in 10, uh, no, none of them are getting treatment. Mm -hmm. And then the depression is the number one and it costs the US $193 billion of lost earnings with people with depression who either can't go to work or, or aren't working. And then there's about 2 million folks that end up being jailed, not for being having a mental illness, but because of some activity or some action they've taken. Um, and then you still have this untreated issue that cannot be resolved. So I just want to give you some perspective on just how big a problem it is. It's pretty big. I, I, I was actually pretty surprised when I saw those numbers. Uh, 832,000 for a state with our population. Man, that's a lot of people. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Before you move on yes. from that, I, um, I, uh, you had mentioned that it, it's harder to keep track of these calls and what is what what steps are you taking to actually more accurately you know account for these types of uh you, when you if we had a crt team instantly available i would think we would be using it more i think calling it in from the county maybe and maybe that's i'm wrong so but well what we're trying to do right now is one our officers uh we're, gonna, we're trying to clean up how they do the cit referrals okay because a lot of times what will happen is these are repeat folks that you end up contacting. Right. So I may contact the same person maybe daily, yeah. depending on what that what the issue is with the person, but it maybe it's maybe it's weekly. Well, the officers are on the impression that they should just do one CIT <laughs> referral, not another one, another one, another one. So we're going to clean that part up. Okay. Then the second thing we're going to do is we're trying to figure out a way that if let's say I go to a theft, but it ends up, hey, this person's got a mental health issue, yep. right? Um, how do we flag that and, and do something in our CAD system to where we can pull that data back out and realize, hey, this is because we can't change it from theft because that's what the call was. Right, right. So that's something we're working on. I'm okay. not sure what the solution will be for that. Okay. But we do know we want to try to track it a little bit better to understand just the full. But I can just tell you, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't hear it on the radio where someone's getting dispatched probably multiple times a day with some mental health substance abuse problem that's associated with the call. So it's pretty right. It's pretty normal that's that's happening. And so if you if we can't measure it, if we don't have the measure yeah. for it, we can't do anything about you know, or yeah. we can't try and solve yeah. it or, or, or create systems that address it, I guess yeah. is the better way to say it. Yeah, so, absolutely. So I think we and we're probably not the only ones. I'm sure. The I, the I, again, I would I would suspect yeah. it's yeah. across the <clears throat> yeah. all police departments. But anyway, I guess I think we would the council would be very supportive of, of spending time trying to figure out how yeah, to well, do we're, that. Hopefully we'll be able to leverage this what we have now, whether it's yep. CAD or there's some ways to put data in there and then extract it out if you put it in the right way. Yeah. But I'm not an expert on that, but we, we are working on trying to figure that out. Okay. Thanks. Go, ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and then, you know, employee wellness is another thing. It's led by uh, uh, Jennifer Roger Flynn and Lieutenant Dillon. You know, we've really, through the peer support this year, uh, they on their own, just started calling everybody to make sure that they were doing well. And they've done that repeatedly throughout the year to check on me. Joe even called me uh, one day out of the blue and asked me how I was doing. Um, <laughs> but um, and then we've 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 we're working with code four, which is right down the street from us, actually right there in the um, same business complex. Oh, and code four is that um, um, psychological services mm -hmm. for officers, uh, specifically for officers. So we work with them. And they are actually provide, they just provided training for all of our peer support team uh, to give them some refresher training on how to contact people, how to talk to people. And then we have, you know, quick, easy access to uh, if someone needs a, wants to go talk to somebody, all they got to do is call, make an appointment, and they send us basically an anonymous bill for that one service. Um, now, it's not ongoing forever. We have other resources that are ongoing, but to get them immediate access, that's all they have to do. And then it's also anonymous, so they don't have to, you know, one of the, one of the barriers was, you know, they kind of had to sort of go through their supervisor mm -hmm. or go to HR and they've got to have this awkward conversation. And uh, that's a big barrier, you know, so taking that barrier away is a big deal. And then uh, we're still waiting the grant approval, the one that you guys approved for, I think it was about 14,000. So we're waiting for that and that'll help uh, support some of this. And then we're working on some financial wellness and uh, it's hard to get people to drink the water when you take them to the, you know, to the water source, but we're working on it. And then fitness, we're working on that as well. Uh, again, it's been really challenging uh, with COVID. So, and 
And there's a good picture of our VIPs. We got this just under the uh, buzzer uh, for the uh, uh, for our appreciation lunch that we had for them. It's probably one of the last good things we got to do. Uh, it's been a big impact on all of them. A lot of them obviously were a little bit older and have had to really isolate themselves. <clears throat> we were able to get them vaccinated through uh, when, when the police department went. So they were very, very, very appreciative of that. And so they've returned back and are starting to come back to the office. Um, and I think they're super excited about that. And we have tried to keep them engaged on teams, but um, you know, it's been a little tough with not being able to really assign them. And some of them actually have continued to help, but they've helped from home with some different projects. Hmm. Go to the next one, Jay. They came out and helped us on Halloween. So I don't, I can't remember if they were over at the art center as well, but either way they- that No. Was, that's the candy no. delivery system that was uh, <laughs> a PVC pipe they're holding there. Yes. Yeah. But they made it just been at the PD. I'm not really sure. But they, they did a great job. They helped with mask making. They helped with, um, they did this thing at Morningstar where they painted rocks and, yeah. and took them over to Morningstar. And apparently some of the uh, residents there came out and stole them. They were supposed to leave them, but they took them <laughs> over to their rooms and they wanted one. And it actually was a big hit. Um, and, and then they also helped us out with Veterans Day at Morningstar when we uh, with, uh, got that organized. So, <clears throat> you know, they, they want to participate and they want to do stuff. So we. We certainly appreciate them. Go ahead and go to the next slide. There, I was and, like, there better be a picture with those kids in the horse. Yeah, yeah so, <laughs> you know, I, I'll just tell you, you know, I was approached by her, uh, by, by Diona, um, Officer Weil, I don't know, probably a month ago. She's super excited, did a really nice job putting it all together. And the reality is that the way it's done, you know, it's very minimal cost to us. It's, uh, there's some legal things I need to work with. Uh, to work out on how that actually is going to work. We're just going to use it as a community outreach tool uh, for the most part. We're not going to be patrolling Highlands Ranch with a horse or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you, you can just see as soon as you had that horse out there, people just flocked right to it. And, yeah. and I talked to uh, Serapis and Tony about it, and they say it's just one of the best tools they've ever had when they have them out at events. <clears throat> and the officers really enjoy it. And, and we'll, we're probably going to end up partnering with um, Parker mm -hmm. so we can support each other and the county because we'd want to have at least two out there at any given time so they can both pay attention and watch out for each other. Um, they're highly trained. Um, at, go ahead and go to the next, the next slide. And so, you know, that's Sergeant Cummings. He's been doing this for 30 some years and he's the actual the regional trainer. He trains the Denver Mountain Patrol guys. He trains Arapahoe County. He's Douglas. going to the Ukraine. What's that? He's going to the Ukraine for a month to, to do this. I didn't to know. Train. That. Yeah, he told me. Yeah, he, he's definitely the, yeah. the expert on how to do that. Groot's a seven year old. I decided to give you a little information about her. Blue Roan Gelding. And um, <laughs> she's got some traffic experience, parade experience. And she's been, Officer Wiles, been going on her own on her days off to go train, um, unbeknownst to me until recently. And um, she's pending to get certified on May 23rd through 28th. And again, the only cost to us really is about $600 worth of leather stuff to put so it looks like an official horse from Lone Tree. Yeah. And uh, outside of that, it's her responsibility for the horse and the animal. And that's how all the programs are ran throughout mm. the county. So pretty minor uh, upfront cost for us to, I think, bring out a really wonderful tool, especially if, if you're going to see people react that way to it and, and interact with the officers in a positive way. Yeah. So go ahead and go to the next slide. <laughs> And I'll just go through some statistics. Uh, if something piques your interest, let me know. This is a March through December comparison. So this is COVID hits and what did we see kind of happen uh, trend wise? I just kind of highlighted the ones that you see that went up. So we did start seeing an increase in criminal trespass, which is breaking into cars. We did start seeing a slight, I, I thought slight disorderly conduct. I thought we would see more domestic violence. We didn't, Good. pretty flat. We did see a lot more eluding. So people just not stopping when we're trying to stop them. That that continues, I would say, weekly. We have mm -hmm. someone, we just had someone yesterday at the mall jump, drive their truck over a curb and flee from a, a contact. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, which of course, is these are extremely dangerous when, when they do that because they, they drive completely out of control. Um, you see frauds went up. Um, they're gonna, you're probably gonna see a really big spike uh, in, in 2021 because that's mm -hmm. when we've really taken the lion's share of our mm -hmm. uh, unemployment um, cases, but we saw a, a, a spike in that. And then motor vehicle theft has gone up. And these are these are countywide as well. This, these are our numbers, but this has occurred, I mean, really throughout the uh, throughout the county. And we've been working closely with our impact team 
We've had them deployed over here several times. Uh, we put bait cars out uh, just because of the, the activity we've had. And a lot of it's over there on Park Meadows uh, Drive. Right. And then uh, our thefts are down, but it's a little deceiving because you had about a three or four month period there, including, you know, when you think about it, including fraud, where there's just so many things shut down that yeah. it was more difficult for them to find a place to go commit that, commit those crimes. Okay. Go ahead and go to the next. And I just want to show you, officer, one more, that's right. Officer initiated stuff, you'll, you saw a lot of spikes in community policing going in the neighborhood. So we just really started focusing on doing that, that type of activity. And then these are just our, our general uh, trends for citizen generated calls. You can see we're pretty significantly down. It's about 15% uh, down from uh, 2019, but you know, we were really down during those first four months uh, where it just, and then when we finally started getting businesses back up, the mall came back, then the call started coming back to where more of a normal level. Um, and then of course you see our officer initiate activity. Most of that where you see those large numbers is Again, neighborhood policing, uh, business checks, and so on and so forth. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And then, as, as I said, theft is, was down pretty significantly, um, uh, but I, I doubt it's going to stay like that. If all the businesses are open, we'll be right back probably at those other numbers. Uh, fraud, uh, again, was up. Go ahead. And I, I'm just going to go through these really fast, yeah. but, but if you have a, a specific question. So suspicious activities. It, it basically stayed flat. Used to traffic accidents. Uh, there's a benefit from COVID. <laughs> I will tell you, my drive to uh, my monument through the um, through the gap has been wonderful uh, <laughs> because of the lack of traffic. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And then your 911 calls uh, didn't really go up that much. And then I did look at all disturbances, so fights, domestics. Those we saw a slight uptick, but nothing more that I thought. Nothing to me that you know alarming gets my attention at all. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And arrests, we, you know, we're a little down um, in felony arrests. Uh, some of that's because it's no longer a felony to possess certain things. So, um, but, uh, and again, without the calls, you don't end up making these arrests. But I, I think these will be back essentially where they were as long as we can keep all the businesses open. So go ahead and go. And then these are just volunteer hours. You know, despite all the challenges, they still were able to volunteer 2,604 hours of volunteer time and still helped us with 5,000 calls, which is, you know, I thought pretty significant considering about half the year they weren't even here. And, you know, some of them, so even when we had some here, some couldn't come in because they're at risk. So with a very short staff of VIPs, they, they did a lot of work um, with what they had. Go ahead and go to the next. And these are just some of the things they were able to perform. I don't know if we needed house watches as much this year as we have in the past either. <laughs> People might have been in their homes yeah, a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, but again, I, I, despite the lack of ability to come in, I thought they really did. They did everything they possibly could this year. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And that's it. Any wow. questions? You have been busy. We have. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I would expect. And I, and I also want to say, you know, In-N-Out Burger, um, you know, it's been a really good collaborative effort <laughs> with um, you know, not only um, Justin's team with Public Works, um, but really with all the city staff and with, you know, with the mall staff out there and, and with, you know, the folks with in and out Burger. And I think everybody, Scott did a fantastic job right, drawing up his uh, plan. In fact, Lakewood wants our plan. Everyone wants our plan. All so, the mayors are clamoring for it. Yeah, so that was a really good effort and the same, uh, same good collaborative effort on the bridge. So, yeah. Uh, and I think that hopefully that communication level of high level of communication between our team and Justin's team will continue. So it's definitely made that successful. Any so, questions? I'm sure there's going to be some. So I'm going to open it up to council because I kept asking mine during the presentation. Uh, <laughs> council Member Shaw. I just think um, it's interesting to see the, the uh, figures and some of the things that I suspected were not really um, supported by the numbers, so it's really good to uh, to see those. I'm really pleased about, you know, the training efforts and uh, the refreshing efforts and the community policing. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am of the uh, Lone Tree Police Department. Whenever I talk to people, it's like, oh, we have a process, <laughs> you know, okay. so um i i'm just um nothing but compliments 
thanks for being their leader and inspiring them to do such good things for our community. Thanks, I appreciate it. Councilmember Anderson. Thanks for a very thorough presentation to begin with, Chief. Uh, You're welcome. Some of it uh, seems to have some relationship to COVID and what went on last year. Um, as a council member, I guess my concern is this mental illness, mm -hmm. illness issue and just not knowing what to do about it. And well, you're I mean, kind I, of on the point in terms yeah. of seeing it right. and to the extent that you can help us along the way. Yeah. What are the buttons that can be pushed? How, how can we help? Uh, all the information we've heard from, uh, unfortunately, the media, but from experts in the health field is that the residual effects from mental health and with the isolation that we've seen over the last year. You're a point man. Mm -hmm. Your people are in terms of seeing the public. And to the extent that we can do more you know, or what it is that we might be able to do, uh, I think we'd appreciate your continuing to keep your eyes open and your fingers on the thumb, thumb on the finger, if you will. What, yeah, how I, can we help in this I area? I think that, you know, the CRT program, um, you know, it's a great program. And it, but it, in the moment, to get there with a person in crisis, it's pretty effective. I mean, that's a very effective way to get some of the immediate services. The long-term services and to get people plugged in, I don't know what the answer, you know, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, and I, I guess my only thought would be is maybe to get, maybe become more part of the regional conversation about mental health in Douglas County because they do have a standing group that, that works on that particular issue. And it's not just all about what police are gonna do, it's about what the whole system needs to do. And, and I don't know if it's you know a legislative matter where there's not enough funding and, and I don't know. It's a complicated issue, but I'll tell you, I was a little, when I saw the NAMI numbers, I was like, wow, I did not expect to see the numbers that high to be almost a million people that have been diagnosed or they believe has some type of mental health issue. So I, I will, if I think of anything, I'll definitely uh, pass that on. but. Maybe a start would be just to be in part of the discussion at, at the regional level. Council member. Great. Yeah, thanks, Chief, for all the time you spent on the presentation. Great job. Um, you know, it's great to see the new faces, but it's also really good to see the promotions from within and everyone climbing the ranks. And I think that probably helps morale, would be my guess. Yeah, I think um, so. Internally, for sure. So that's all great to see. I also wanted to compliment you on the collaboration with the sheriff and the other police departments. I think when you have all this collective knowledge and if it's on a silo, it doesn't really help as much as if it is when we're all working together on similar issues that you're seeing. And it was a benefit to me. I think it was a benefit to them um, that we talked about what challenges we were facing and actually shared some ideas about, well, we're going to do this and here's what we're, here's the steps we're going to take. And and so that really helped, especially early on when we were like, what do we do? You know, how are we going to ask or what, what, how are we going to respond to calls? And we just all kind of talked it through. So it was good. If nothing else, it was we were just supportive. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, great. Yeah. No, yeah. And one, one other piece, too, just I get so much positive feedback from the residents just in, in how friendly, how visible the police department is, how uh, humanistic they are. Uh, so I just wanted to relay that right. on to you. It's, it's, uh, it's been a weird year, as we know, on lots of levels, <laughs> for sure. But uh, we support you guys inherently. So. No, we appreciate it. So, so you don't really know until you're tested. Well, I would say you, you guys have been tested. The department has been tested between the COVID response, the social unrest, the, I think, uh, one-offs that have happened, even just with the bridge response and having to get teams out there to get that shut down. And, and the... the tested with good things like the In-N-Out Burger and how you're going to manage all of that. So I think uh, you guys have certainly, uh, the, the department has certainly risen to all the challenges thrown at them. And I think that speaks to your leadership. So I just want to say on behalf of a grateful council and a grateful city, thank you for that. And I think um, I think the advancements you've made or, or tweaks that you've made dealing with the training and the oversight and the supervision I think really have paid off in what you've seen with the morale and the retention within the department. So yeah, I, I will just say this, I, and I appreciate the compliment, but what's really, I think, changed more than anything is the way the supervisor team has come together. I yeah. Mean, they are, like I said, Seth said on a meeting, I, that's the most interactive I've ever seen them. Yeah. Now, they it's progressed slowly. Yeah. But he said it on a great meeting where they were just, 
very positive. Um, I mean, it was just, it was pretty refreshing just to hear. Now, it's, it's been like that more often than not the last probably 18 months. Um, but that, you can tell there's an impact there. They're a little more cohesive. Um, I think there's more consistency across shifts. Um, I think the commanders and myself were working really well together. Um, and so I think that really has been the biggest thing uh, that helped is to just have you know, a unified plan and everybody on board with that plan and the message being delivered correctly and consistently uh, people being positive about the future. And so, and that starts with the sergeants, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, so I think that has been the biggest thing is getting that group to finally, in my opinion, finally come together um, and really try to collaborate with one another. Nothing so. like a crisis to help with that. Yeah, so, that's to, true. <laughs> so you took that's advantage. True. Yeah, what did Winston Churchill say? Never fail to take advantage of a good crisis. So yeah. glad, glad it's all working out. No, but really great exactly. presentation. Really appreciate it. And I think we do want to follow up on the mental health piece of it, okay. and also with our officers. I think that you know, making sure that I'm very happy to see that there's additional resources available to them without the sticking points of having to go through a supervisor. But I really do think we as a community owe it to the department, but also to the people that we serve to have a better understanding of the, that element of, and, and to make sure the officers are trained appropriately and have the resources they need to deal with the mental health issues. Well, if, so. you're, if you're interested, I can reach out to the Douglas County Mental Health Initiative group yep. and get someone with a lot more expertise than me to maybe come and talk about what they see and, and maybe a little more regionally because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's not just about police response. It's about a whole bunch of other right. issues within the mental health um, resources that are out there. And they can come and maybe give you a little bit better picture about what things we could do um, and then what, what are they are already doing. I think there's a great suggestion okay. and I would I would even suggest that it's something that's the partnership of Douglas County governments. I want it for the city of Lone Tree, but I think your point about having it be a regional effort will make even a bigger impact. So I, let's get it here and then let's also look for Seth to bring it to the Douglas uh, partnership of yeah. Douglas County they governments. They present a, a, well, a year and a half ago, year two years ago, maybe the CRT and uh, health and mental health, but a lot's happened since. Yes, I, absolutely. So we're, we can design a plan for the county to kind of move all in that direction because um, I think COVID has also highlighted the mental health challenges and that, that existed before COVID came right. along. Mm -hmm. COVID exacerbated them and they probably introduced some others. But anyway, I think that's some place that we want to see more information and okay. more resources. Uh, so I'll, thank I'll you. All right. Appreciate all right, it. Appreciate it. So now on to the legislative update. We're going to hear from Jeff what other things you might have to do uh, next year. So uh, <laughs> with that, Jeff will be our Director of Economic Development and Public Affairs, is going to be presenting remotely. So Jeff. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for uh, a minute of your time tonight. I will be uh, 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 brief with this update. Uh, the legislative session just began, um, and we'll have some time to go through some initial bills that you'll see. but. Uh, um, uh, there's lots uh, to come in the future. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, just a couple of, of real quick things to, to, to kick it off. Uh, this is the uh, first session of the 73rd General Assembly um, uh, for, of the state of Colorado. The, the, there's a new face in it. Uh, the House Speaker is Alec Garnett. He's from District 4 in Denver. Um, and then uh, obviously with uh, the, uh, or what's uh, new about the session is that uh, uh, due to COVID, they had to postpone uh, the beginning to uh, February 16th, uh, which means it will actually end uh, if they uh, continue it to, to the uh, to the very last day on June 12th of, of this year. Uh, next slide, please. And now I'll, I'll go through a list of bills that are initially uh, introduced and ones that uh, um, we uh, should be thinking about as well. Uh, the first to just be aware of, there are several bills that they're calling supplementals. Uh, that are basically um, addressing the fact that the state budget is healthier than they anticipated you know, six months ago. And they're actually looking at uh, the existing state budget in this year, their current fiscal year, and trying to reallocate dollars back to programs that they cut. I, I titled this broadly economic development because there are several offices of the governor that uh, fall in this area that uh, are going to be funded again. And um, uh, this includes the OEDIT, it includes the Colorado Council on the Arts, it includes uh, uh, other entities that we may ask for grants from. Uh, CCI uh, uh, provided us with a, uh, a grant recently from other state 
So it, it's it, there's a lot of work being done to restore state programs that were there in the past, and that's what this bill does. It's passed entirely through the Senate and it's now uh, being uh, uh, discussed in the House of Representatives. Next slide, please. Uh, a couple around uh, just local government and administration that are, are interesting or are worthy of our, our watching. Uh, uh, it's the House Bill 21 uh, 1025 is around um, um, emails and open meetings law. Uh, what this uh, bill would do is uh, eliminate or um, um, clarify the what uh, is uh, uh, potentially available for a, a Colorado open records uh, request um, for you know just non-substantive email communications. So you know any you know to oversimplify an email from Michelle to you to schedule a meeting is no longer something that they can um, request in, in, in a Cora. Um, uh, ask and and just just to rid the the paperwork that is needed in a um, this type of request. It is uh, no, today it passed the House on third reading and it'll head to the Senate and I think most people anticipate this will, will make it through. Next slide, please. Yeah, another interesting one, um, and you may have heard this in your in the, the various meetings you go to. There is a, a a movement out there to to uh, uh, and some you know municipalities in Colorado are moving to rank choice voting, especially for at large seats um, uh, in nonpartisan races where if there's uh, you know not a clear majority winner in an election, there there's a runoff or they call it an instant runoff is, is another way of describing this. Um, what this bill actually does is it helps fund. Uh, the, sec the Colorado Secretary of State and, and the various counties that have to do uh, coordinated elections. If, if a municipality in one region wanted to do this, it would help make it uniform statewide so that one you know, city in uh, um, one place that is not doing it differently elsewhere. So there's act there, the, the primary work being done by the state is actually to help fund uh, these systems and these, this training to help make it work statewide. It doesn't necessarily uh, prohibit or uh, uh, allow the rank choice voting. I, I, in certain cases, it's happening already, um, but it, it, it creates a statewide uh, uniformity to it. And it, this is also uh, moving along as well. Uh, next slide, please. A couple uh, interesting ones in uh, the, you know, the liquor licensing world. Uh, this one's quite simple. It, uh, it would continue the uh, takeout and delivery option for uh, alcoholic beverages. Uh, currently under the executive orders or you know, the, the uh, emergency uh, uh, regulations. Uh, the 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 ability for restaurants to do this would uh, end on June thirtieth of this year. Uh, this would allow it in perpetuity. Uh, next slide, please. Another one that you might uh, see in the future. There there's a, a bill being introduced about uh, alcohol beverage uh, festival for tastings and sales. What this does would. Um, uh, add a new uh, permit uh, for consideration that uh, does exist for wineries today, but they'd like to uh, establish it uh, across all different uh, uh, liquor license types so that uh, in, uh, nine times a year, uh, you know, a, a, say a liquor store or a restaurant or, a, uh, you know, an entity that sells liquor can do a, a quote unquote festival, which is basically a sales event um, and uh, invite their other vendors, their uh, partners in to, uh, you know, have a, uh, a daily event to, or you know or for a period of time to uh, you know sell their 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 uh, product so it's not necessarily a, you know uh, the same as a uh, outdoor uh, event there would still be special event licenses required for those kinds of things but it would be interior to uh, an existing liquor license holder where they could have their own um, um, sales event as well so you, in the future you may be seeing licenses such as these uh, next slide please uh, this will be a very interesting year around public safety. I'll, I'll start it with, uh, you know, the there's talk and it, we will be seeing some uh, reform around Senate Bill 217. Uh, I think a lot of new things that are coming that are being proposed by uh, uh, various groups, including the ACLU. Uh, two of them that have been introduced that uh, I want to run by you are our first Senate Bill 31. It's uh, limits on limits on governmental responses to protests. Uh, this one. You know, it is probably in some ways what you would expect a, a, uh, the government response to be to a protest to let it occur without unless there is imminent threat of force or violence to cause personal injury or uh, property damage. Uh, however, uh, by codifying it, I think there's a lot of worry now that, you know, it would also limit other reasons for stopping a uh, protest. Let's say they were in a public right of way um, or on public property. Um, and, and uh, you know, just in the middle of a road, the, there, there's worry that, there, that this, this is a very limiting bill um, for uh, what may be a very necessary reason. So uh, we'll be watching this for sure. Next slide, please. 
And then the one that's getting a lot of attention that's been introduced to, to date is the Senate Bill uh, 62. It's called Jail Population Management Tools. Uh, what it does in a lengthy format is uh, uh, um, talk about uh, a process to reduce uh, jail populations and prison populations. And it just really uh, uh, oversimplifying it, it uh, prohibits a peace officer from arresting a person based upon a Divine, defined set of what they're calling minor offenses, but there's a whole list of offenses that, including municipal ordinance offenses, certain felonies that uh, you know would would require you know the, the person to be on their third. Um, oh, I, forgive me. It would just there'd be a certain set of these that uh, uh, would uh, you know stop a, a, um, a police officer from you know, making the arrest. And then second, it prohibits a, a court from issuing a monetary bond for a, another, def the same defined set of minor offenses generally, um, unless it's their third time, uh, in, uh, you know, being um, seen for the same offense and a whole bunch of other things. It, it still hasn't had its first hearing. Um, it's been assigned to the Judiciary Committee in the Senate and uh, something that I know we'll be watching uh, very closely. Uh, next slide, please. And then the last two in the, from the state level, there it will be a lot coming from transportation. The two I want to highlight uh, first is has does have a bill number, uh, Senate Bill 110. You, you probably heard the, the governor at the very beginning of the uh, the year, you know, celebrating uh, appropriately that the, that the state had more uh, revenue than they anticipated, and they were looking for shovel-ready projects to invest in and uh, safer streets, mobility, you know, main street programs, that, that, and. Uh, um, ultimately, it was uh, whittled down to about $30 million and is now being introduced as a bill to fund CDOT for these types of programs. Uh, I bring this up because we applied for a similar grant when it was a pilot program and they had $5 million and uh, um, we, we didn't receive a, a response. But now that they're making this a larger program, I think we'll, we'll keep our eye on it again. Um, uh, so it's, it's been introduced and it will be uh, heard in, uh, um, well, it's actually passed the House of Representatives. It'll now be heard in the Senate. Um, I'm not vice versa, my apologies. And then finally, uh, there's a, another transportation bill. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in discussion uh, that will uh, fund uh, transportation overall statewide. Uh, next slide, please. And it has not been introduced and, and Mayor, I'll, I'll let you uh, um, uh, speak on it as well because I, I, it is, it is, there's a lot of uh, stakeholder uh, discussion happening, a lot of uh, um, uh, negotiating happening, but uh, as uh, we know today, Senator Win Winter and Representative Gray will be introducing a bill to um, attack on user fees to uh, your um, uh, at the pump or other places where fees can occur, um, such as the you know, um, uh, vehicle charging uh, that will fund you know statewide and local priority transportation projects, and its introduction is still. Um, to be determined. You know, Mayor, I don't know if you uh, know of a date or other things I should add to that, but I, I, I'm leaving it vague um, based upon what I know. So I, th I think that they are hard at work negotiating a deal. I think you're absolutely 100% right about the idea of modernizing. They're talking about modernizing and future-proofing the transportation, funding the transportation system, looking at a signing uh, new fees or charges on potentially gas, electric vehicles, and TNCs, the transportation network companies. There, This is work that's come out of, uh, I, don't know if it was SB, I think it was SB 239 to look at this issue. Um, one of the Metro mayors have been in a lot of conversations with the legislators about um, really happy to see you looking at future proofing. And if you're going to look at uh, creating a new revenue stream. We would like you to look at a new funding for a funding distribution formula, because right now the existing HUTF formula that was created in the 1950s and last updated in the 80s does not reflect our current transportation system. It, you know, when it was conceived, we did not have the uh, mobility issues. We didn't have the transit dependent populations. We didn't have underserved populations. We didn't have the equity issues. And we did not have the climate issues. We did not have the ozone non-attainment and we did not have the greenhouse gas emissions. So to only look at one side of the equation without addressing the significant need in the urbanized areas of our state that are continuing to see less and less investment strictly because of the HUTF formula and the way the money is divided um, we really think and could not support 
anything that did not address that because this is going to be the shot, guys. This is this this bill is going to fund transportation for the next ten years, or not, or not, <laughs> right? And and in currently, uh, um, the Metro Denver region receives only thirty six percent of the CDOT investment in our state. We have um, fifty eight percent of the population. We contribute. Uh, over 60% to the sales tax revenues that are generated and on the order of 65% to income tax. So we are really advocating with our legislators to make sure that the metropolitan planning organizations, there's five of them, where 83% uh, of the state's population reside, uh, really are, their transportation needs are going to be met and HUTF distribution does not do that. So. Um, I spoke with leadership uh, on Monday afternoon on a call uh, representing the Metro Mayor's Caucus, and that was my uh, position to them is that don't just look at one side of the equation, please look at both. And, and there is you know, need throughout the state that is being unmet. So that, that's all I have to add. The, the plan, Jeff, as far as I know, is to still, the, the release of something is eminent, but I know there are continuing negotiations going on regarding it. So. My two cents. Yeah. Yep. But uh, Jeff, appreciate it. Was that the last one or is there uh, well, more? Thank you. And there's just, just one more, but I think uh, yep. worthy of uh, yeah, the presentation. And this is uh, switching to federal legislation. Uh, you've yep. uh, likely been reading about this in, in, the, in the national news, the American Rescue Plan, which is the President Biden's $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus package. Um, uh, on Saturday, I guess the last bullet here is it passed the U.S. House of Representatives by seven votes, uh, 219 to 212. It's now off to the Senate, and, and the Senate uh, will uh, have a uh, it will have to receive all 50 Democratic votes and a, a vote from the Vice President to, to see it pass if it is to. But they, 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 the, the story is they'd like to see it happen in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but part of that 1.9 trillion is uh, 350 billion dollars for states, municipalities counties, tribes, and territories. Uh, and I'll, I'll just, I'll just uh, quickly break this down. You know, uh, $130 billion is for local governments split evenly between counties and cities using a modified CBDG formula to uh, um, determine, uh, you know, what a entity would get. Uh, a, a spreadsheet's been floating around uh, that uh, we have seen of, of what uh, uh, um, our, you know, local communities would receive. It shows that the city of Lone Tree would receive roughly $2.8 million. Uh, the state of Colorado would receive roughly $3.9 billion, and uh, Douglas County would receive $68 million. So uh, uh, stay tuned. We'll probably know something in the next uh, couple weeks on uh, the fate of this bill. Uh, and that's all I have, but uh, I'm happy to answer any related questions. Thanks, Jeff. Any questions on any of this? No, I think we're going to want continued updates, obviously, while the legislature's in session, so we make sure we're we're engaged at the CML table, the Dr. Cog table, the Metro Mayor's table, and all the other tables we sit at. So thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Thank um, you. All right. Last, we've got a consent agenda review. We've got a, a, a not a typical item on our consent agenda this evening. It's Resolution 21-10, a resolution appointing a member of the Lone Tree Arts Center Fund Board. And we have Michelle Sosa Mallory, our Director of Corporate and Foundation Giving, here to just give everyone a preview not that you didn't see it in the packet but michelle yes, please thank you good evening it's so nice to see you yes nice see you <laughs> um so i really have the privilege tonight of discussing with you and recommending yet another um, exceptional community and business leader for appointment to the lone tree arts center um fund board of directors next slide so um, City Council is being asked to approve the appointment of Becky Takeda Tinker as a member of the Lone Tree Arts Center Fund Board of Directors. Um, Dr. Takeda Tinker will represent the Colorado um, State University system and CSU is very excited about her service on our board and so of course they affirm her, her appointment and uh, will offer support to the Arts Center, and that means um, a financial contribution to the Arts Center, which is part of the bylaws of um, board service. Um, and we hope that it will also bring other kinds of support, like new collaboration opportunities um, to, to all of us, to the city and to the Arts Center. So if appointed, she will serve a three-year term beginning March 2021 and expiring December 23. She'll be the part of the class of 2023, which was just reappointed in January. So next slide. 
Um, some of you may know Becky Takeda Tinker, Tinker well, but in case you don't, I just wanted to provide just a few highlights. Um, she's really, I believe, exceptional. She's an exceptional leader. Um, she just started a new position as the Chief Educational Innovation Officer for the CSU system, which is really a cool um, kind of position, and it is really involving partnerships with other um, academic institutions, with other businesses, and with other governments. So it's really a nice fit for her to be a part of our board. I think um, she'll bring a lot of new ideas and um, some opportunities. And before that, she was the president of CSU Global. She served there for 12 years as a president, and she was basically the founding president, so really helped to launch that model for CSU. And best of all, she's a longtime resident of the um, City of Lone Tree, and she's an enthusiastic supporter of the Arts Center. Every time that she comes here, I'm always so intrigued. This is what really drew me to, to Becky and to kind of get to know her, is she always has a crowd. She brings a crowd of sort of new new people to introduce to the art center, be they colleagues or friends or um, other. At one time she brought a contingent from the um, Japanese consulate and that was really intriguing. That was kind of fun. And so I think she just has so much excitement and really believes in the art center and she's been just a great ambassador already for the art center. Um, so it, uh, we look forward to the new association that she brings with CSU as well. And next slide. So our suggested action for this evening is that Council adopt Resolution 20-10, a resolution appointing Becky Takeda Tinker to the Lundry Arts Center Fund Board of Directors to a three-year term beginning March 1, 2021 and expiring December 31st, 2023. And this resolution is part of this evening's um, consent agenda. Um, and that's really all I have. I'd be happy to take your questions if you have any. Well, we just want to say thanks for attracting this gem to the uh, fund board. We couldn't be happier with that. Um, any questions uh, other than just our gratitude to Michelle and thanks for the good work on that. And sure. I think we'll look forward to uh, approving that with consent. Well, I think she'll be happy to hear that. Well. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. without a doubt. And then given that, any questions from council on other matters on our consent agenda this evening? Not for me. No. Okay, well, that concludes our agenda for our study session. So we will adjourn, or we're not adjourn, we'll step away while we have our dinner break and we'll see you back here seven o'clock. Thanks everybody.